Jules. So I'm going to speak to you about one of my research projects, which is um, funded by the Leverhulme Trust and uh, in, in the UK and based at the University of Sheffield. Uh, it's called Women, Conflict and Peace, uh, Gendered Networks in Early Medieval Narratives. And what we're doing really is it's a quantitative, large scale investigation of women's roles in medieval sources from the fourth to the eighth centuries. So we're covering quite a broad uh, time period and quite a broad geographical area. And what we really want to do is interrogate the idea of women as connectors of men, which is one of those sort of tropes you get of medieval society that women are sort of, you know, seen as important as connectors of men, but also reduced to just being connectors of men or not seen as active in their own right or in any way independent of the male relationships they have, whether it's, you know, parents, brothers, spouses. I mean, they're the, they're the three main ones that women are connected to. Sometimes later on, also bishops become a factor and, you know, alliances between bishops and queens can be significant. And because we're looking at, you know, a relatively long time period, fourth to eighth centuries, we also want to look at change over time. And to see, you know, is there a discernible difference in the way women are presented in the earlier period as opposed to the later? And also, if there is, then to you know, think about why that is, because we're not following any sort of uh, reductive linear view of history. History isn't linear and it doesn't all, you know, progress doesn't happen in a straight line. There are many examples that uh, would prove that that, that pro progressive model doesn't hold in my view. Um, but we needn't get into that now. Uh, but this is, you know, this change over time element is is important for us in seeing, you know, what what are the differences between the fourth century and the sixth century, or the sixth century and the eighth century. We're interested in social networks and in so you know who's connected to who at a given time, but also in dynamic networks, which is you know how networks change over time. And in in because we're working with with written sources, with narrative sources, we we see that progression happening in the course of a text. The main sources that we're looking at uh, are, are by the, you know, the, the, the people on the screen now. They may or may not be familiar names to you, I suspect, probably unfamiliar for the most part. Uh, we're starting with Eusebius, who was the sort of, the sort of father of church history, or a very important history of the um, ecclesiastical history of the early church in the fourth century. Um, he's, he's sort of covered from the, the Roman world, with Gregory of Tours, um, Benantius Fortunatus and Bodonivia from the uh, the Frankish world, which was now modern day France, Northern Europe, Germany, Netherlands, that sort of area. And uh, Stephen and Bede from, um, from Britain, specifically Northern Britain, the, the, what was the Kingdom of Northumbria. Um, of that list, our main, our main uh, writer is the only woman is Bodinivia, which is just how medieval sources are. There are very few surviving that are identifiably by a woman. Um, we're also doing some other using some of the smaller sources around those to sort of fill in some of the gaps in the time period and just to sometimes you know another you know even a, a much smaller source about a similar similar events can shed light on the, the, the um, presentation of history in the main the te te source you might be using as your main text our methodology is primarily it's it's in the first instance about data gathering so we, we read our sources uh, very carefully. Um, there's, there's a team of us doing this. Um, we record every character and every interaction that they have. We distinguish between the gender of characters, which is obviously important for our purposes, looking at the role of women. Um, so we have, we actually have time for three, three um, categories of gender. We have male, female, and we have non-gender, um, which is primarily because we're dealing with medieval sources. So we have angels and spirits and demons and, None of us wanted to get into, you know, the, the debate about the gender of angels and, you know, what exactly that might be. So we thought it was simplest to just separate that off. And for our purposes, if our if our authors aren't being clear on what they think the gender of an angel is, then it's not it's not for us to second guess that or to engage in any form of angelology to that extent. We're also very interested in recording whether characters are named or unnamed because that that's actually really interesting in in telling you about, well, we're not entirely sure what it tells us yet, actually, because the, the patterns that we're seeing are not entirely clear, but, you know, often there's a sense that, you know, women are unnamed, and I'll give you an example of that in this paper shortly. Um, but sometimes people are, are unnamed in a way that's that's beneficial, so there's an attempt to, we have to determine what the cultural conventions around naming were you know, in, in understanding this, but it is something that um, how names are used is really interesting and who gets named and who doesn't is something that we've become very interested in 
We also categorize our relationships by types. We have 21 categories of relationship, and I can explain that in more detail um, in the session on Wednesday. If anybody wants to know, um, do, do please ask. And uh, I might even remember them all. I may, or I may have to consult my files, but I'm happy to answer questions on, on that or anything else. And our approach is close reading, not distant reading. And distant reading works in, in some context. But what we want to do, the level of, of a granular detail that we need, especially in categorizing relationships, it has to be done by, by close reading, by an informed searcher. We, we, you know, you have to, this is something that has to be done by somebody who actually knows the material, knows the society, knows the context, and can actually make something like a judgment call on, you know, what, what type of relationship something is, whether it is um, in quite where you might want to fit it, whether, you know, obviously something like marriage is easy, but other relationship types might not be so clear. Um, so that that's where we need, and with any data gathering, there's there is you know with all of these things, there's a certain there's a human element, and we we do make a call, and we try to be upfront in and clear in what the calls in what we're what we're deciding to do, what calls we make. Uh, in terms of temporal networks, we're interested in the idea of dynamic networks and the way in which a network can change over time. And how can you reflect that mathematically? And that isn't a question of just you know taking snapshots of you know a, a certain text at different times that would be easy and, and the scientist on the project because we are an interdisciplinary project we have um historians me here in cork and in sheffield and uh physicists in coventry and in uh, porto alegre in brazil and a computer scientist in porto alegre in brazil and from the, the physicist side there's there's no challenge in just creating taking snapshots of the text but what they want to see is can you measure temporal influence and that that's the type of dynamic networks that we're talking about and i'll come back to that a little later as well the way we do this is we record characters and interactions chapter by chapter very painstakingly through each text and again that's interesting because what we're doing is we're not trying to recreate what society was like in, in the Middle Ages, we, we can't do that, and that would be, you know, would be a, an impossible goal, and therein lies the way to madness. Um, but we're trying, what we're, we're recognizing, we're dealing with sources by particular writers, so we're trying to reconstruct their worldview. And what does that then tell us about? Well, can you determine what women could actually do, but also what ways in which are women presented doing things? And that that's what's important to us. So we're working on narrative sources, which are, you know, primarily histories and biographies of saints, the, the genre known as hagiography. And you know, generally those those sort of models um, follow an art, you know, linear framework. They move forward in time. They're progressive texts. So in terms of determining a temporal network, they're very useful as opposed to you know other sources because you have a sort of inbuilt chronology within the text. Uh, but what they're what they're also interesting for from our perspective is is understanding the sort of narrative network, the narrative progression, because sometimes, you know, writers do put in flash forwards and flashbacks in their sources. So in taking this model, we can see the way in which the author wants wants you to follow the narrative, wants, you know, the way they, they the way they the story unfolds in their telling is actually interesting for us understanding their aims and their impulses and their objectives. And the more we can understand about what the author is trying to do you know, the, the more depth we can bring to our analysis of the source, and then the more we can understand the society that person is coming from. So in terms of, of this project, what are we learning from our approach? Well, we, we're seeing, and we saw quite early on, that the way in which women's importance in the networks varies uh, greatly. And the way it varies depends on a lot. It depends on, on the author. Some authors are just more inclined to tell us about women, and some are not. Some really don't talk about women at all. Um, the context, the culture, you know, the, the immediate um, cultural context of the writer, whether, you know, there's somebody who is at court or is in a monastery can make a difference, but not always in the way you would think. And the time it was written, um, you know, that, that, that there is a difference in, you know, what we're seeing that in the treatment of women in in the fourth century sources and the and the eighth century sources. And um, actually, the the eighth century sources tell us a lot more about women. Um, we think that's partly a reflection of society, but you know, it is interesting that we can see the difference. Women's importance also varies depending on, on the measures that we're using to um, examine um, to examine these sources and examine the, you know, the networks we create. Uh, and you know, the three measures I wish to talk about in this paper are degree, betweenness, centrality, and communicability. And I'll, I'll actually explain these when I get to them later on rather than, than, than doing it now. Um, but one of the things that we can, we're doing in this project as well, that we're finding that 
some of our results by taking this, this different approach, by taking this very kind of careful, granular, quantitative approach and combining it with more traditional qualitative historical methodologies are allowing us to challenge existing views on scholarship, especially views of how women are presented. And that, that's really interesting and really exciting. It's what we hoped for at the beginning of the project, but you never really know at the beginning what, what's, what's actually going to happen, how it's going to really unfold. So we, we've been very pleased that in this case, our, our hunch, our instinct, uh, was correct. The two sources that I want to talk to you about uh, in particular today are, are these, these two, um, Bede's um, Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which is one of the major um, sources for the early history of Britain. It was written in the early 8th century, completed in 731 uh, in, uh, in the northeast of Britain, uh, the region of um, what is today Newcastle and Sunderland. And it's a really important book. It's an epic. It, it sort of starts with the invasion of Britain by Julius Caesar and the Roman armies in you know, sort of 60 BC uh, or 55 BC and something like that. And then it, it moves forward to two beads on day. The majority of the book concerns the seventh century, which is the, you know, the sort of the period, the decades just before Bede's own life when Christianity comes to Britain and you know the, the writing arrives and the world sort of changes. And he, he he's brilliant and he's so important on relating his version at least of how that transition took place and the, the impact you know, the arrival of Christianity has. And, and we have just a wealth of information in Bede source um, there. And our, our statistics are there. We have 594 characters, uh, 509 men, so you know, predominantly male. I'm you know, not, not denying that we're, we're scratching around in, in the dark a little bit. There's a huge gender data gap <laughs> in studying women in any period, but particularly in the Middle Ages. Um, 72 women and 13 non-genders, that's generally angels and spirits and the like. And then 2,720 edges, that's how many connections in the graph. And the graph you're seeing, it's really, it's, it's just a, it's a model, it's a mess. You can't really see anything or you can't read that graph uh, in any real sense. Um, just to explain, I mean, it, it is the whole text. Um, the, the green um, upwards facing triangles are the male characters, uh, the, the pinky purple, I think magenta was the colour that the, the scientists who drew the graph um, said that it was. The, the magenta triangles point downwards at women and the yellow um, the yellow dots are the non-gender. Um, we, we were um, <laughs> criticised recently by, in a publication we just had accepted um, in, the, in the first round by the peer reviewer for having chosen um, a shade of pink for women, but that, that's really not, not what one should be doing. Um, so we have, we will be changing that in the final version. There won't be pink and teal. It, it will, it, it's something else that is not quite so um, reductive perhaps. And the other source I want to talk to you about is Stephen's Life of Wilfred. And it's an account of this really important Northumbrian bishop called Wilfred, who also features prominently in Bede's work. Uh, Stephen was a little bit older than Bede. He, he's finished this work around 710. So about 20, he wrote about 20 years before Bede. And uh, Bede used one of his sources when he was writing his history was Bede's account of Wilfred. And again, in Bede's, um, Stephen's work, it's 100, 167 characters you know, 140 men. So again, predominantly male, that this, this is what we're seeing, but that that's as it is. Um, there's no point, um, you know, delving into that right now. Um, so in both these sources, they, they are they are heavily male dominated. Um, the, the, I think the percentage of female characters in Bede is, is just over 12%. And in Stevens, like Wilfred, it's just about 14%. So they, you know, they are a minority, you know, in, in these sources. And um, and the thing with 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 Bede and Stephen, quite a lot of um, work has been done on both of these sources in different ways. And the, the part I want to speak to you about today is um, what historians in the past have said and scholars have said about uh, the way women are presented in both texts. And the sort of prevailing view in scholarship is that Bede suppresses women and. Stephen gives them much more scope, that, that Stephen allows women much more agency, and he's a much more sort of expansionist um, author when it comes to women and is therefore much more useful in telling us about women, whereas B just seems a bit um, unhelpful and, uh, and repressive and, and doesn't actually tell us that. Now, as you can see, the, the statistics don't really bear that up. I mean, they're 12% and 14%. That's not a substantial difference. Um, so, but we took it further and, and we looked at, you know, we, we did have our network graphs, which, as I say, you, you can see can't really read a whole lot from them. I mean, you can see in this one that Wilfred is right at the centre, which you would expect in a, in a work about him, it, it, which basically 
runs from his life from sort of cradle to grave and then some posthumous miracles at the end because he's a saint. So he is at the centre. There's no such obvious centre in, in Beats. There's no one person it focuses on. So you've got you know, three different sort of central figures uh, depending on different times. Um, so we then, we, 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 we have our graphs, so we, went, we then moved into the, um, so looking at the, the, the data, you know, the, the metrics underpinning the graphs, because you know, the graph is a visualization of, of the actual data. And uh, we used two different measures to compare Stephen and Bede. Um, the first was degree, the second is between centrality. And um, I'm sorry about the pop-ups. Um, uh, so and degree is basically it's it's the number of connections that somebody has um, in, in 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 any in any group. So you know if if you know if your friends are twenty people in in a particular context, then your degree in is twenty. And so, so we we plotted all the characters in in these both of these books, and we've plotted all their connections. So then we 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 can you know, run it through the program. We can guess how many who how many who is how many characters everyone is connected to. And in both sources, it's interesting, it's intriguing that, you know, the most, of course, with the most connections is Wilfred. I mean, that's not surprising for Stephen, but it's a little more surprising for Bede. Um, in both also, um, the, um, the most important figures um, for degree uh, and for between us actually are kings and bishops. Um, and, and bishops includes popes, because you've got Pope Agatha and Stephen and Gregory the Great uh, in Bede. So you know, these are the most important figures. These, have the, these are the most, um, these have the most connections. And um, but we compared then, in, you know, we, we took the, and they're different. These texts are different sizes. You know, there are many more characters in beads. So we compared uh, the top 20 percent of characters just to see where women feature, because and to see, well, you know, are women more you know, prominent um, in, in Stephen rather than Bede using this metric? And, you know, we, we discovered that actually in the top 20 percent of characters in Stephen, um, only four women appear. But actually, for the top 20 percent of characters in Bede, there are 12 women. So actually, in terms of the number of connections people have that actually women are higher up the ranking in bead. So that was interesting. We, we don't quite know what that really means yet, but that you know, it's still an interesting result that women have more connections. Therefore, they're mentioned more often. They're connected to more people. So more prominent in bead text than people might have um, suspected. Uh, we then turned to a betweenness centrality and betweenness measures the kind of like more not so many, it doesn't matter how many connections you have it's the quality of your connections so you might only be connected to in, in a medieval in a medieval context someone might be connected to only five people but if, if they're all kings and bishops then that person by virtue of their connection is very important so betweenness measures not an individual's own number of connections but the, the quality the height the value of the connections that they have so the role they might play in bringing different people you know at high degree together and that that actually is interesting from the perspective of women because the traditional view women are connectors of men and women actually that we, we noticed in both Stephen and B that when we look compared the two texts with the top 20 percent of characters uh, for between us they both have slightly more women than they have for degrees so in in stephen uh, and the top 20 percent of characters there are five women and in b there are 14. so actually we were seeing as as we look at the measure of you know connectedness and who's connecting people and how and what kind of people are they connecting women become more important and what was even more striking for that uh, in b was that not only are there more women in the top 20%, but actually there are in the top 12 characters in the book, there are three women appear for between us. There's only one for degrees. So, and the women are, there's, it's, they're here, there's Hild, who's the abbess of Whitby, is a very important figure, and Anflid and Ethel Drida, and they're both queens of Northumbria. And they actually are, in terms of the way the narrative works and in, in underpinning the kind of, some of the social networks in the text, um, they are very important women. So it's, it's interesting that that was reflected. But again, it was it was intriguing too that this these women these these connections don't come out in Stephen. That actually, in terms of the structure of the network, um, women are much more important in Bede's account of history than Stephen's. So that that was that was puzzling and that was interesting and that does challenge the existing um, scholarship. So we thought we would take it a bit further and try and look at. The women in, in detail in, in both in, in both works and see what exactly is going on. So we took Wilfred as the case study to compare his connections in both. And um, in Stephen's life of Wilfred, there are 24 women, and of those 24, Wilfred is directly connected to 17. 
So he's connected to seven queens, three abbesses, four family members, and three women witnesses miracles. Uh, there are 72 women in Bee's history, and but Wilfred is only connected to seven of them. You know, and there are three queens, one abbess, and three family connections. So uh, Wilfred doesn't do any miracles in Bede, uh, which is interesting for a different reason. I won't delve into that now. So just to, for the remainder of this, just to focus on the queens. So we basically, what we find are that there are four missing queens in Bede. And in Bede's account of Wilfred, he, he loses four of the queens that um, Stephen talks about. And considering Bede is using Stephen as a source, that's really interesting. So where do these women go? And that's one of the reasons that the, the kind of consensus has grown that Bede is suppressing women, because there are more women in a source he's using, and we know he's taking them out. But we want to look at well, why, who are these women and why is he taking them out? Because, you know, it is actually, when you look into it, it's a bit more complex. So of these four women, three of them are really interesting. There's this uh, Jörmingberg, who's the Queen of Northumbria, Astrid, the Queen of Mercy, and the Queen of the West Saxons, whose name we don't know. And then the fourth is Aetha. She's in a different category, which I'll explain. And what's really interesting about this on one level is that um, of these, these four women, um, Stephen only names one of them, whereas two of these women, Astrid and Aoife, are actually, they're in B, they're just not connected to Wilfred. So they, they don't, they, they know they haven't been taken out of the text. They're just not connected with Wilfred in it. And Bede actually gives us their names, uh, which I think is interesting. And of the, the first three I mentioned, the three in, emboldened, Jörmingberg, Astrid and the Queen of the West Saxons, well, the role they play in Wilfred's life is really, um, is, is in a very negative one in that, you know, Wilfred is Bishop of Northumbria and he's a very controversial figure and he ends up expelled from his own diocese several times in his life by different uh, kings and queens. Uh, but Stephen, in writing it, very much blames Jörmingberg, Queen of Northumbria, for all of, I mean, almost all of Wilfred's ills. And he, he presents her as a Jezebel type, and he writes that, you know, she poisoned the king against him. So in one of Wilfred's exiles, he's kicked out of Northumbria by Jörmingberg and her husband, Egfrith, but Jörmingberg is, is, is the, gets the blame, and he flees south to Mercia, the next kingdom. But unfortunately for Wilfred, the queen of Mercia, Astrid, is the sister of the king of Northumbria and sister of Jörmingberg, so he doesn't have any respite there. Astrid and, and, and gets her husband in the case, and, and poor Wilfred is expelled from Mercia, so he flees further south, and he ends up with the West Saxons. And the Queen of the West Saxons is the sister of Jörmingberg. So he again is expelled from there, and then he finally ends up with the South Saxons, where the king and the queen take him in, the unnamed king and queen. So what, what we're seeing with these three queens, Jörmingberg, Astrid, and the Queen of the West Saxons is that they're in the book because they're all hostile to Wilfred. And what we've got this extraordinary hostile kinship network, that you know, female kinship network that's that's turned that's used against him. That's entirely absent uh, in Bede. Uh, the, the other queen, Aoife, in, in the South Saxons is interesting because Stephen claims that you know the king and queen, unnamed queen, uh, take Wilfred in and he converts into Christianity. Bede actually tells us a different version that that he says that Aoife was already queen when she when she moved when she went to the South Saxon and she's a, she's a, she's already Christian sorry and she's she remains a Christian in at the at the court of her husband. So Bede presents this woman as you know not beholden to Wilfred first of all, but also sort of an independent actor in her own right. She you know converts to Christianity in her home kingdom of the Witchy don't quite know where that is. And then, you know, keeps her faith at her husband's pagan court. So she's, you know, very interesting as a different character, but that that's all absent from, from Stephen. She's just this nameless queen that Wilfred converts. Um, but in terms of the, the hostile queens, if we can show a, a graph of the hostility network, and um, you can see here, this is um, all the hostile, the, this is the, the relation categories of hostility that we use in our in our data models. So it's military, political, religious, hostility, things like that. And you can see that the size of the node um, indicates the, the degree in this case. You can see Wilfred is the largest node, he's at the center, and he's surrounded by all these hostile women. You know, there's, there's, there's more than just the three I've talked about, but Jörmingberg is, is the most prominent there. Um, Hild is also there, the Queen of Mercy. So there's, there's these, there's all these women, they're, they're basically getting at Wilfred. Um, if we look at the hostility graph for, for, for Wilfred in Bede, which is basically Bede, Wilfred is in books four and five, we can see that um, firstly in book four, there are no women involved. And in book five, the one woman, Bald Hill, this uh, Frankish queen who Wilfred did cross, is the only one that survives. So Bede isn't so much suppressing women in his account of Wilfred, he's suppressing evil women. 
which is a very different thing. He's suppressing, he's removing the bad queens. He, he's taking out, you know, the, the queens that are making the royal families look poor. And he's giving us a very different version of Wilfred's life. And it's interesting because Stephen is writing a very defensive account of Wilfred, you know, within a year or two of, of his death. And he's looking for someone to blame and he blames the women because he probably doesn't want to antagonize the, the royal families too much. Bede is writing 20 years later. He's writing, his book is dedicated to a king. He probably doesn't want to be too rude about the king's ancestors and the royal lines generally. So he just sort of removes all these evil queens. He just takes them out of the story. They don't appear. The only evil queen that survives in terms of Wilfred is um, this bald hill, this um, Frankish queen who's irrelevant in terms of um, political circumstances in um, uh, political circumstances in uh, in Bede's Northumbria. He does have a, a you know a woman here, but this is this is this is the Queen of Mercia who ends up being murdered by her Mercian nobles. Nothing to do with Wilfred. So it's very interesting that we're seeing a very different telling of Wilfred, and Stephen basically uses women as a tool to get evil done. Bede cuts all that out. So it does challenge how we think about um, about the presentation of women in both texts, because it's, it's easy just to look and say there are more women in one than the other, therefore one is better at women. Actually, the way the women are presented tells a very different story. And the final point I want to turn to is this idea of communicability, which I mentioned at the beginning is the third measure we've started using. We haven't done a comparison of Bede and, and Stephen for this, we've just looked at Bede. And Communicability is essentially a measure of influence over time. So we can do it for static graphs, but we can also do it for the dynamic ones. And it becomes into its own when you look at dynamic graphs. And this is essentially a, a table of communicability for friendly connections in bead and it's a dynamic connection. And what we see here is that, you know, there are five women that are actually quite prominent. Um, uh, one of the most important characters, I think the fourth most important of all is this Queen Anflet who has, a, you know, for her, her community level is really high. And it's interesting because in terms of degree and betweenness, Hild was the most important woman. But for communicability, for influence, it's, it's Anflet, it's this queen of Northumbria, which is, is really fascinating. And uh, we look at, um, again, if we look at uh, the same measure for hostility, and in this one, we have all the books taken together and then the dynamic ones. So you can see there's a bit more going on here. And the only woman that appears in the top 20 is Anflet. Um, so Hild is nowhere to be seen. So you know that the, and women are much less important in hostility and bead across the board uh, than than they are in 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 other sources. We've seen how important they are for Stephen, but we can see that in terms of friendly connections and you know positive influence, women are quite you know relatively prominent. Um, and Flit is especially so, um, but for hostility that they're, they're almost absent. So women aren't that hostile in, in Bede. And what's interesting about this as well is in terms of understanding the way uh, the network is structured. We have here a network graph, a different form. And this is this is a network based on communicability, not degrees. So the size of the node depends on somebody's communicability measures. So Anfid is the biggest um, female node. And this one, the women who are named are in this sort of salmon color. Salmon is the, the, the color palette that the scientists told me that this one. The kind of bluey grey are, are women that are unnamed, and then these these sort of grey characters are um, they're the men, and then we're not trying to be in any way um, regressive by not naming men. It's just our focus here is women. It would mean the graph would have got very messy if we put all the men's names in because there are so many more. What we see here is that Anfid is the most important, but she's surrounded, as you can see, by these larger um, male nodes. And what, when we tested the vitality of the network, and by, by doing that, it means removing certain characters, it quickly became apparent that Anfid's hostility measure is entirely dependent on her husband. If you remove her husband, the King of Northumbria, then the hostility measure that we saw, you know, Anfid appearing here, she disappears entirely if you take her husband out of the equation. So her hostility is all linked to people he's he's hostile to, which is interesting. And the other thing we notice when you try to take out different characters, um, figures like Anflid and, and Elflid and Ethelbert and Northumbria, other sort of prominent women in the communicability measure, if you, as you can see from here, um, for the most part, when certain prominent men, usually their fathers or their husbands are removed, they disappear. The woman, the one woman who seems um, invulnerable to this is Hild. You know, she she might she's not the most important in terms of communicability on her own, but she uh, in in the whole graph. But she's she's 
she's the least affected by changes to the network. So removing a whole lot of different characters, Hill's values don't change, which is really interesting. And we think, you know, historically that's because you know, she's abbess of, of a prominent um, a double monastery, so it's men and women, but she's not dependent on any male relation for her position in society, whereas the queens always are. You know, and generally they're princesses first, so they're they're they become queen because their father was a king and they're 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 married to the right person. And the thing with being queen, it's very different to being king in that the king is a role unto itself. But once the king dies, the queen is doesn't matter what happens, the queen is just replaced. You don't get to be you don't stay as you don't stay as queen, um, you know, just just because you know your husband is dead, you, you the, the next king's wife becomes the queen. And this is something that we, we we've actually been able to show in uh, in these in this um, network analysis of these texts. So the final thing I want to, I want to finish on is just again to talk about but beat um, through this final um, symmetrical matrix of direct female female connection in B because and this is it's symmetrical so every connection is duplicated so you should draw a, a kind of a diagonal line down here and then you see that it's mirrored because there is this you know this argument that you know bead suppresses women and you know it doesn't it doesn't tell us about that much women but actually he tells us about more women than anybody else he tells us you know more about the women he, he talks about than any other any other contemporary source but what he also does is he, he presents female female connections and that's really interesting because if you're familiar at all with the Bechdel test, which is, you know, something that was started life as a joke. It was, it was, a, it was a comic sketch where, you know, a, a female character said she wasn't going to see any more movies unless they, you know, had fulfilled three criteria. They have to have two named women who talk to each other about something other than a man. And um, this, this is something that, you know, the, and the amount of, um, of modern movies that fail the Bechdel test is really quite astounding. Um, but actually, B passes it. B, B talks about a lot of women, and he names them, and they're connected to the women, and there's nothing to do with the man there. So, in an extraordinary way, you know, B, this eighth-century monk, um, writing in his monastery in the northeast of England, um, is is actually, you know, you know, in some ways more progressive and, and gives a better presentation of women than uh, than than many modern movie makers do. Um, so I'll finish on that. I want you to think about, you know, in, in general, when you're doing your own research projects, it's important to always, you know, bear in mind, um, you know, that, you know, different approaches will yield different results. And it's important to employ a variety of approaches, you know, to, it's also worth remembering that the status quo isn't right. You know, the mainstream view need not be accurate. It can just because people have been doing the same thing in the same way for a long time and taking a different approach can challenge that. And, Really, the more the nuanced approach you take yourself, the really the better it will be um, for the for your, your ultimate project. Thank you very much. I'll speak to you uh, again about this on Wednesday. <laughs>